Good morning, everyone. This morning we're going to continue our look at, uh, at Genesis, and more, more specifically, the aftermath of the flood. Now, <clears throat> this, this, uh, this chapter, chapter 10, 9 and 10, are very interesting, and, and we're going to spend some time in chapter 9 looking at God's covenant with Noah and his descendants. With Noah and his descendants. This is a new covenant. Now, we're going to find as we go through the Old Testament and then into the New Testament that God makes covenant after covenant after covenant with his people. Now, <clears throat> most of the time, <clears throat> excuse me, most of the time, the new covenant is an expansion or a change to the original covenant, but the theme is always the same, as we're going to see in just a few minutes. So let's look at chapter 9, uh, verse 1. Then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the earth. It said God blessed Noah. Now God had already blessed Noah, hadn't he? I mean, he brought him through the flood. He kept his family and all their, all their animals safe. That's a tremendous blessing, isn't it? Particularly in light of the, of the cataclysmic events that were going on around them, with the seas tossing and all that. They were already blessed. But now it says, after the flood, he says, God blessed Noah and his sons. How are they blessed? In a threefold way. He says, be fruitful. In other words, bear fruit, right? Bear fruit, just like it says in the New Testament. We are to bear fruit, aren't we? And how did that fruit manifest itself? By following the commands of God. That's how we bear fruit. We follow God's commands and his will. And he was telling Noah to do the same thing. Be fruitful. Increase in number. Have children. Natural children are a blessing, aren't they? They are. So are children in the faith as well are a blessing. That's part of of what God is trying to teach them. He says, fill the earth, or as the Great Commission puts it, go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus said it and applied it in a spiritual way. God is talking about it in a physical way. But the message and the point is the same. Obviously, this part of the command of God, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth, is a forerunner or a type example for Christ's command to his disciples. But, but, as we all know and can tell, things have changed. Things have changed radically. Remember we talked last week about the fact that God said, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. And that tells me that this is a new order of things. And it's an order that we can count on. Things have changed dramatically. For example, God says the fear and dread of you will fall upon the beasts of the earth. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. This is God's promise to Noah. Well, why this fear and dread of the animals? Well, it's a very simple answer to protect them for their protection. I mean, if animals aren't afraid of you, it's, they're very easy to kill, aren't they? They certainly are. So this is for their protection. As a result, they will be harder to kill. Man will still have to work hard just to eat. The curse of Adam remains. Remember, God told Adam, from the sweat of your brow, you're going to bring forth plants from the earth. You're going to have to work hard to provide for your families. And it's going to be hard to kill things that are running away. Now I know we have hunters in here. I'm not a hunter, wasn't raised to it. I have nothing against hunting, not at all. <laughs> but it can be very challenging because the, the, the animal that you're hunting doesn't want to be found. right? So it's a challenge. Now he also says the promise the promise is also for the animal kingdom. They will not only fear man, but each other. Right? You've seen umpteen National Geographic specials, I'm sure, where the, where the wildebeests are getting 
chased by, by whatever, you know, they don't like each other, right? Why? Because they need protection. So again, that was for their protection. And the giving of meat as part of their diet is in addition to, not rather than, the green plants. Another blessing. What do we get from meat? Protein, right? Uh, so we find God blessing in a different kind of way. Different kind of way. Now, there's other commands that he gives in Genesis 9, 4 through 7. He mentions this thing called an accounting. Look what it says. But you must not eat uh, meat that has its lifeblood still in it, and for your lifeblood I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal. And from each man, too, I will, I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. So God is saying, for your life, I'm going to have, I'm, I'm going to have an accounting. You are responsible for yourself. You are responsible for yourself. Nobody else can do things for you in a spiritual sense. I am going to demand an accounting for you. You can't say, well, you know, because my parents did this or my parents did that, that, that I'm okay. No, that's not what God says. Everybody, every man, this is right here in Genesis, right? I'm going to demand an accounting. Animal life, animal life. God will de demand an accounting. In other words, I think he's going to look at us and how we took care of his creation. And we're going to have to answer for it. We as a people, individually and collectively. And the life, for the life of, of man's fellow man, God will demand an accounting. God answers Cain's question, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, <laughs> is the answer. God says, I will demand an accounting. <clears throat> Among man, blood for blood. Look at this. He says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God, for in the image of God has God made man. Blood for blood. There must and will be a blood sacrifice for the spilling of of human blood, a creature made in the image of God is precious in his sight. Man is the only creature that God made in his own image. The only one. All right? And we know from John 3, 16, says, you all know that, I didn't even bother to type it in. God so loved the world. Just stop there. We know, so, uh, and he gave his only begotten son, so on and so forth. But God so loved the world. And he hates, he abhors the shedding of innocent blood. We find that throughout, uh, throughout the Bible. So <clears throat> the preceding is, is man's part of the covenant God is establishing. What's man going to do? He's going to be accountable. He's going to have to be responsible. He's going to have to take care of what God has given him. And he's going to have to look out for his fellow man. That's part of the covenant. That's part of the agreement. That's part of the contract God is establishing with people. Well, what's God's part of the deal? Well, first of all, who is the, who is the covenant with? He says uh, uh, in uh, uh, ch uh, chapter 9, verse 8, says, Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. I am making this covenant with you, Noah, with your sons, with your descendants, with the animals, with everything on the earth. He's pledging to protect everything, every living creature on earth. And he says, never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. I mean, God's pretty definite about that, isn't he? And he gave the sign of the rainbow. Beautiful thing, right? Well, had rainbows been around before? I don't think so. I don't think so because of the cloud cover and the atmospheric conditions. I don't think a rainbow had ever been seen. 
You know, I drive back and forth to the island at least once a day, and sometimes twice, and occasionally three times back and forth. And I've had the privilege of seeing rainbows in various configurations out over the salt flats when we've had showers and stuff like that. I've seen rainbows that went from, from horizon to horizon, huge arc. I've seen rainbows in the clouds. In fact, I took some pictures uh, one day of these rainbows that are in the clouds. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. It's amazing, isn't it? And God says, I'm placing this rainbow in the sky as a confirmation of my promise. So I will see it, and you will see it, and remember my covenant with you. An object lesson, if you will, a reminder, if you will. We find God doing that all throughout Scripture, giving his people reminders. We're going to talk about the Passover eventually. The Passover was a very important festival, wasn't it? It was to remind the Israelites what God had done for them. These reminders we find all the way into the New Testament, don't we? The Last Supper. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, right? So let's, let's, uh, here's some observations I have for, for, chap, for chapter 9. The word accounting, when he says, I demand an accounting, is used three times at least. The phrase, I will, is used three times in association with accounting. You know, whenever you hear God say, I will do something, you know what that is? That's his law. That's his law. There's no ambiguity to it. He's, he's not going to say, I might do this. Or if certain things happen, I'll do this. No, he says, I will. You can bank on it. You can count on it. There's no way around it. We are responsible for ourselves, our fellow man, and the very earth itself. Uh, and like the old song says, there's a reckoning day a coming, right? <laughs> Jesus talked about it in the parable of the talents and in the discourse on the sheep and goats. There is a reckoning day a coming. We are, we, are to be, we are to be accountable even till the book of Revelation. Christ's revelation to the apostle John also mentions it in Revelation 20.12, and I did type this in. And I saw the dead, great and small alike, standing before the throne, and books, plural, were opened. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Now, if we look at that passage a little more carefully, we'll find that there were two books that were opened. One book had to do with everything everyone has ever done in their life. The second book is a book called The Book of Life. The Book of Life. We'll get to that in due course. In any case, there's a reckoning day of coming. God says, I'm going to hold people accountable. So once again, we see the relevance of the Old Testament in general and Genesis in particular. We also see the consistency of God's promises, his blessings, and his standards throughout Scripture. God is not a changeable God. He's the same yesterday, today, today. And tomorrow, and we find this beginning in the book of Genesis. And it carries through all of Scripture, even up to the end of the age. So let's look at the descendants of Noah and the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel. Uh, the descendants of Noah eventually spread throughout the earth, but not until after the Tower of Babel event. Uh, Japheth was one of his sons. His descendants went northward and settled in the regions around the Black and Caspian Seas. They became the progenitors of the Caucasian races of Europe and Asia. Most of us come from, descent. we are descendants of Japheth. Most of us, not all of us, most of us, some of us. Ham, <clears throat> uh, his descendants formed the south zone of nations, and the Hamites went southward. The names given in the scripture seem to indicate South and Central Arabia, Egypt, the east coast of the Mediterranean, and the east coast of Africa. They became a race unto themselves, we know. Canaan, grandson of Ham, no, uh, Canaan's, was he a grandson? Or son, anyway, Canaan, son of Ham, and his descendants gave their name to the land that later became the homeland 
of the Jews. Canaan, the land of Canaan, right? Egypt, by the way, was called Mizraim, which is the name of Ham's son, which is why we, we suspect the Hamites went that direction. Now, the Shemites, that is the descendants of Shem, later known as Semites, <clears throat> they formed the central zone of nations, and they were the Jews, Assyrians, Syrians, Elamites, and others. They settled in the north Euphrates Valley and its borders. Two interesting descendants of Shem, one was Eber and his son Peleg. Now, Eber is where we get the word Hebrew. Hebrew, right? And Peleg is an interesting character. His name means division. And he says in the, in the verse about Peleg, that's verse 25, chapter 10, he says, one was named Peleg because in his time the earth was divided. The earth was divided. There's no explanation what division they're talking about. But as usual, I have an opinion, right? <laughs> it's just my opinion. Bear that in mind. I think it could be some type of continental separation caused by earthquake or volcanic activity or something like that happened to the earth during the time of Pele. Don't know what it was. We can speculate all day long, but uh, it's just, that's my opinion. Now there was another interesting character which <clears throat> came along during this 400 year period. His name was Nimrod. Nimrod was the grandson of Ham. Now he was a mighty warrior. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord and he protected his people from wild animals. He was an outstanding leader during the 400 years before the flood and Abraham. It seems as though he was the leader of the Tower of Babel enterprise and he built cities after the dispersion. He built Babylon, Erech, Akkad, Kalne, and then that's the general uh, same area around Babylon. <clears throat> Babylonia, that area was known, long known as the land of Nimrod. He went 100 miles north and founded Nineveh and other cities. So he, he was responsible for developing two of the major cities in that part of the country, Babylon and, and Nineveh, ancient cities. Now the Tower of Babel, let's look at that story real quick. Men had one language, one language. I had an old uh, uh, professor in college who, who was a Hebrew professor, he taught Hebrew. And he says, I don't know why you guys bother praying in English to God. Everybody knows Hebrew is the only language God understands. <laughs> Which is not true. Uh, but the men had one language, one language. They moved east from the ark and settled in Shinar, which is Babylonia, <clears throat> rather than filling the earth. They just went a little ways away, found this wonderful, lush plain, very fertile, and they, they stopped there. They stopped there. And in defiance of God, and evidently under the leadership of Nimrod, they built a tower to reach to the heavens in an effort, like Adam and Eve, to be like God. To be like God and not be scattered. They didn't want to be scattered. They were comfortable. They had a good place to live. And here's an interesting uh, tidbit. It says they used tar in the construction of the tower to make it watertight. To make it watertight. They did not believe God's promise to Noah. And the covenant. When Noah said, I mean, when God said, I will not bring floodwaters to destroy the earth again. They didn't believe it. So they built this tower, coated it with tar to make it watertight in defiance of God. We'll show you, God. We're, we'll prepare if this happens again. <laughs> in order to force the dispersion that he had commanded, God conf confused their language. And evidently, the various clans had their own languages and went their separate ways. We just talked about the descendants of Noah. Now Josephus, the, uh, the Jewish historian, has some comments about this, this, uh, this incident. I'll remind you that Josephus, in his writings, had access, in his research, 
to historical documents that we don't have today, that have been lost to history, because he quotes from them. But here's what, here's something he said. Now, <clears throat> now the sons of Noah were three, Shem, Japheth, and Ham, born, during, uh, born 100 years before the deluge. <laughs> These first of all descended from the mountains into the plains and fixed their habitation there and persuaded others who were greatly afraid of the lower grounds on account of the flood. So were very loath to come down from the higher places, but eventually they did. And they, become, they became very prosperous. It says, but they, imagining the prosperity they enjoyed, was not derived from the favor of God, but supposing that their own power was the proper use of the plentiful condition they were in, did not obey him did not obey him. Nay, they added to their disobedience to the divine will the suspicion that they were therefore ordered to send out separate colonies, that being divided asunder, they might <clears throat> the more easily be oppressed. They wanted to stay together for mutual protection and prosperity, and they weren't giving God the glory. They were, they were, they were doing it all themselves. Boy, that's human nature, isn't it? It really is. We find it all the way back in Genesis. Now, uh, here's what, uh, here's Josephus goes on. Now, now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man and of great strength of hand. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God but to bring them into a constant dependence upon his power. Dependence upon his power. Wow. That's many governments today, isn't it? Force people to become dependent upon the powerful and their leaders. He also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again, for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to be able to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. That's what Josephus has to say about Nimrod. He goes on to describe the, the tower and the tar and all that stuff, but I thought you might find that of interest. So, <clears throat> This event, while different in its spiritual context, nevertheless gives us a glimpse into how God's will is carried out despite the reluctance of his people to obey him. Now when we get into looking at the Hebrews and the exodus from Egypt and, the, and the, all the things that happened to them in that 40-year period, we find God is constantly, and Moses, constantly having to force them to do what he tells them to do. I, I, I mean, after seeing the marvelous miracles that God had worked in their lives, providing them freedom and a, a, a law and, and his presence, for them to disobey him over and over and over again just doesn't seem to make any sense to me. But it's not just the Old Testament people's. It took the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7 chapter and the persecution that followed for the church to go into all nations and preach the gospel. The church was very comfortable sitting in Jerusalem. They were. They were growing. We know that from the book of Acts. They were growing greatly. And it says they enjoyed the favor of all the people. So they, weren't, they were not fulfilling Christ's great commission. They weren't going into all nations. They were staying right there at home where they were comfortable until the stoning of Stephen. You remember Stephen, the first Christian martyr who had the audacity to stand up before the Sanhedrin and, and as they say today, speak truth to power. And it so enraged them, they dragged him outside the city and stoned him. And remember, he looks up to heaven and he says, I see Jesus standing there he prays, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that enraged them all the more. And the final verse of that, of that passage says, and there was Saul witnessing all this. A young man named Saul taking care of the folks. Well, what happened? He says, on that day, 
in, in Acts, the 8th chapter, the first verse, is on that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. The stoning of Stephen gave the mob, if you will, uh, incentive. It stoked the fires, right? And it says a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. The apostles still didn't get the message. Now, eventually, they had to leave Jerusalem. For the time being, they stayed there, but the rest of the Christians fled. They went throughout Judea and Samaria. Well, that's not into all nations, is it? That's just two nations, Judea and Samaria. <laughs> but for people who had never been more than a day's walk from their home, that was a big journey, wasn't it? It was a good start. It was a good start. And verse 4 says, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went, wherever they went. Sometimes God has to use extraordinary measures for his will to be completed. It happened in the book of Genesis at the Tower of Babel. It happened during the sojourn in the wilderness with the Hebrews. It happened over and over and over again down through the, the history of the Jewish people with their rebelling against God, with God's subsequent punishment, their Babylonian captivity. It goes on and on. Yet, nevertheless, his will continues to be done even to this day. Now, sometimes we don't understand God's will or we don't understand God's plan, maybe a better way to put it. But I'll give you a really good example. It's a, it's a, it's a weak example, but I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Late yesterday afternoon, uh, we were talking with Brock and Jeannie, and they invited us to come have dinner at their house and spend the night, which we do sometimes. Um, the reason was we had to go to a funeral ahead of time, and, and it was... They thought it'd just be a lot easier. Well, it wasn't easier because we had the dog to think about. And we had this and that. And it was last minute. So we said, no, we're going to pass. <clears throat> we're going to have to pass. Thank you anyway. And uh, so we went home after the service and, and uh, finally got back on the island. Traffic was horrible. Went and ate and then <clears throat> went home. Got home about 8 o'clock, something like that. It wasn't late, 8, 8.30. And we walked in, we watched TV, went to bed, took the dog out and all that kind of stuff. About 3 o'clock in the morning, our little dog, who lives in our bedroom, went berserk, barking. Bark, 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 You know? And, well, what is it? Did she hear somebody come in the house? Or I mean, she never does that without a reason. Never. And so, of course, Nina said, get up, get up, go look and see what's happening. <laughs> so I got up, turned on the light, put my glasses on, and stumbled out, out the door and went downstairs and started looking around. Nothing was amiss. Everything was fine. And she was standing on the top of the stairs barking at me. And Nina said, oh, I know what it is. She said, there's a drip in the studio. The studio is right next to our bedroom. Sure enough, our air conditioner had had a some kind of a hiccup and there was there was water just just i mean just drip 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 it was it was coming down pretty good so we rushed around and got towels and a bucket and all that kind of stuff the moral of the story is if we had spent the night with brock and Jeannie, we'd have come home to find a horrible mess because that's a wooden floor it's a wood floor and if it had been soaked no telling how much damage would have been done to it thanks to our little dog so <laughs> God's will be done. He protected us from the water by persuading us not to go spend the night with Brock and Jean. So sometimes, sometimes it's, it's big things, and sometimes it's little things. But we can find throughout Scripture, beginning in Genesis 1-1, the will of God is going to be done. We can either be part of the problem or we can be part of the solution. Right? Hopefully, we're committed to being part of the solution. Okay, next week, we're going to start, a, uh, I'm going to, I want to show you a video. It's going to take about three weeks to complete because you don't want to watch the whole thing all at once. But the title of it is, Is Genesis History? And if you have Netflix, if you have Netflix, it's on Netflix. So uh, I downloaded it to my, to, my, uh, to my iPad so I can show it on the television here. 
But if you get a chance this week and you have Netflix, look for it. It is Genesis history because it, it won't spoil the story for you. In fact, it, it, you need to watch it more than once because these are scientists, geologists, anthropologists, all sorts of learned people who use big words, right, that we don't always use in our everyday <laughs> language. So sometimes you've got to listen to them a couple of times to get the message. But I highly recommend it. We're going we're gonna to watch it and talk about it over the, starting next week. For about three weeks, I think. It'll be enough. So I, I hope you enjoy it. Abrigo saw it already. Yeah, it's good. Uh, it's good. Video. It's good. And I want you to keep in mind everything we've talked about. Through the creation, through the, the, the you know, all the things that, that we've looked at. The flood and all that. Just keep all that in mind. And, and uh, because because they're going to be talking about those exact same things, but from a scientific standpoint, scientific standpoint, and I think you'll enjoy it. Okay, prayer requests. Good to see Eloisa here. Yeah. Uh, 